Okay, so about 40 people already joined our seminar today. Uh, again, good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome. Also, on behalf of my colleagues at ESIPE, um, a very warm welcome to our webinar on the Mobility Package 1, the latest Mobility Package 1 proposals which have been uh, tabled recently and which are now up for a European Parliament road that is scheduled for next week. And in this webinar, we would like to discuss with our topical experts and the audience whether the latest proposals are actually fit or unfit for the single market. I suppose that most people are actually aware, most people in the audience, familiar with the mobility package, which is also called the EU's truck drivers reform. For those who aren't, let me briefly recap what it is about and what will be presented to MEPs next week. Initially, the Mobility Package 1 was intended to improve working conditions for truck drivers, also for small vehicle drivers in the EU. The European Commission explicitly aimed at securing a smooth and particularly non-discriminatory functioning of the single market. Now, according to the Council, a statement that was released in February 2020, the new rules will improve drivers' working conditions and update provisions on access to the EU's haulage market. It was further stated that the new rules are designed to ensure a balance between improved working and social conditions for workers and the freedom to provide transport services across borders in the European single market. And was further mentioned that the new proposals will also be a good contribution to road safety in the future. Now, all that sounds like a great new law for the 27 EU member states, doesn't it? We all know that political framing is important. It is particularly important at the EU level, uh, where we have clashing interests, political interests, economic interests, and so forth. But those who closely observe the legislative proceedings behind the legislative proposals for the Mobility Package 1 will probably confirm that the agenda was shaped by French policymakers, politically openly backed by France current President Emmanuel Macron. And contrary to initial EU objectives, the current restrictions to freight cabotage have been left unchanged. Lawmakers, including the majority of the European Parliament's Transport Committee, are now even proposing additional restrictions to the right to provide transport services freely within the single market. So it seems that there is more at stake than truck drivers' working conditions and matters concerning road safety. Some argue, for example, that cabotage is sabotage, referring to some lawmakers' explicit intent to infringe the fundamental principles of the EU's common market. But anyway, let us ask our five experts today whether the current mobility package for one, uh, mobility package one proposal are actually a blessing or a curse for the EU and future single market integration. Uh, before we start, I would like to ask our audience to participate in a quick entry poll. Uh, it's a poll that is open for 15 seconds, and you can give us your opinion on whether MEPs should reject the mobility package one proposes on July 8th, and you can choose yes, no, or I don't have an opinion. So the poll is open now for 15 seconds. No, people are already responding. Uh, I shall say that this is an anonymous survey, uh, so we won't release any names or votes respectively. Okay, um, now I would like to welcome and also introduce our five topical experts. Uh, we are very glad that we have gathered a rich uh, uh, um, a round group of, of experts uh, from different regions uh, in Europe, mainly from Central and Eastern European countries. We have Clotilde Amor. She's a French-Romanian member of the European Parliament and also a member of the Renew Group, Renew Europe Group. We have Anna 
grew up car. Uh, she has not joined us yet, but I suppose she, she will be joining us in a minute. The Minister's Councillor in the Ministry of Infrastructure in Poland. Agne Makevicuitje, she is the chairman of the board of the International Transport and Logistic Alliance in Lithuania. We have Nicolette van der Jagd. Nicolette is the director general of GLESAT, the European Association for Forwarding, Transport, Logistics and Customs Services. And we have Kosmas Dotowski, a Polish member of the European Parliament and a member of the European Conservatives and Reformists Group. Every expert will now have the opportunity to give us a five minute introductory remark. And I will then open the panel for a virtual discussion with the audience. And that said, I would like to encourage our audience to raise questions along the conversation by using the chat function in Zoom. So now we will start with the first uh, intervention by MEP Armand Clotil, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Matthias. Yes, so I am uh, Clotilde Armand from Romania. Um, and I'm very happy to be able to, 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 give, uh, to give our point of view. We have uh, uh, all deputies, all MEPs from Romania, we have the same objective uh, because this uh, transport uh, industry is a key industry for a country like Romania. Uh, you have to see that so that you understand what we're talking about. We have about 300,000 people, men, who have a, a license to do international transportation in Romania. And it is actually the biggest industry which is bringing some um, money back into the country. From a, a commercial and service and capital uh, standpoint, you know that you have this free circulation of people, of services, of goods, and of capital. A country like Romania, we are losing on most of them. We're losing on the commercial because we uh, import more than we export. We're losing on the people because we have this huge brain drain and we want to keep the people. What is good about this industry is that we can, uh, we can have people living in Romania, but working everywhere in Europe. We, on the capital side, there is a huge capital which is leaving the country every year, uh, which is actually counterbalancing much more the, the, the capital which is invested. Uh, you have to see that actually, if we compare with the cohesion funds, the cohesion funds bring between one and 2% of the, P, of the uh, national product every year, but the, 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 the um, dividends which are leaving the country are double. Half of the economy is not uh, is actually owned by uh, non-Romanian uh, people from Europe mostly. Um, so th this industry is the only one which is actually bringing back some capital, some so, some money, some finance in the country with the IT industry. So on the, if we look at the full circulation of uh, free circulation within Europe, we have people, um, we have uh, the goods, we have the capital and we have the services. The services, and this is a service, the transport industry is the only one where actually Romania is on the positive side. And when I'm talking about Romania, it is the same for Bulgaria, it is the same for a number of Eastern countries. So what is interesting is that myself being as originally from France, but as well Romanian, I can see both sides of the story. And I can understand, I can very well understand why for Macron and for the uh, French people, uh, it was a shock to uh, see suddenly on the, on, the, on the French highways, so many trucks coming from Eastern Europe. So suddenly all of the, you know, the children in the, in the cars, when they go on vacation, when they go to school, when they, they can just see only trucks with Lithuania, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Croatia, and it's, it's a shock. Uh, in, a, in a few years, um, you know, I know that 50% of the trucks on the, in the, um, uh, working for French um, 
transport, I would say uh, transportation coming from France going other, uh, in, another, in other places, 50% were from French companies. Now it's 9%. So it is, it is a psychological shock if you want, you know. Suddenly they could see all those Easterners on the, on the, on the French roads. But what the French people don't know is that there was exactly the same shock. Like the, the, this shock is being echoed by the same shock in Romania. In a few years, there was not any single supermarket or hypermarket which was left from Romania. All has been um, replaced by Carrefour, Auchan, Cora, Metro, etc. There is not any single Romanian one left. You know, we have the same issue with the banks. The banking sector has been completely um, over uh, in, invaded. Is not the right word, but basically, the, the Romanian banking sector has disappeared. Now there is le uh, less than twenty percent of the banking sector. The same in the insurance sector. Myself, I live in um, in Bucharest. I pay my uh, utility bills like everybody for the gas, and it's cold here, so you have huge gas bills. <laughs> For the gas, I pay to NG, GDF Suez or Gas de France. For the electricity, I pay to Enel. For the water, I pay to Veolia. Um, and I can go on. So what I want to say is that what we're seeing is the effect of this European, this single market, which is creating value for everybody. This single market is, it has been measured, is creating value for everybody. But for, on some industries, some countries win, and on other industries, other countries win. For the French people, they couldn't see very much, you know, Romanian companies in their everyday life, except on the highways. And they couldn't accept that. For Romanian people, suddenly their life has changed completely. The, um, the economy, the, the, as I was saying my, uh, earlier, half of the economy, more than half of the economy, in Romania is now owned by Occidental companies. And this has a huge impact on our everyday life. What we need to explain to Europeans that this is what is good about Europe, that you, know, you, you have the best, and this is what is liberalism. We have the best of, um, of each industry from each country, which is winning. This doesn't mean that I don't want rules. I think it is good to have rules in order for the uh, for the life of the drivers to be better but um in the case of the mobility package it is not about uh it is not about improving lives of the workers because we all agree on that it is not about saving the job of the uh, french workers because there were no more french drivers there is a lack of workforce the mobility package the the, the impact of the protectionism rules of the mobility package will be the following. It will be the same drivers, but those drivers, instead of um, working for a Bulgarian, a Romanian, a Lithuanian company, they will work for an Occidental company. The same people will drive the trucks, but the, not the same companies will make the money and not the same, uh, the same countries will take the taxis. This, this um, mobility truck package will have an impact for a country like Bulgaria it has been measured by KPMG between 1.5 and 2% of the uh, gross product. It is a huge impact. So what do we want? Do we want the Bulgarian, tr the Bulgarian uh, drivers uh, to um, uh, drive trucks from a Bulgarian company or from a German company and he will emigrate with, these, with his family to Germany? That will be the result. I, I think I've been uh, talking a lot. I, I really believe in this uh, one market. I am from the Renew Group, but I really, I truly believe that the um, origin of the of the problem is that the, here we're talking about French people because they were the most involved, but they did not understand what is actually happening in the East. There was a lack of communication, a lack of uh, explanation, and we need to uh, to work on this. Okay, thank you very much, Plutit. Um, that was a, a broad perspective. Uh, you mentioned a very interesting um, um, aspects regarding discrimination, the 
perhaps unintended effect on the relocation of workers to companies in Western Europe and so on and so forth, brain drain, uh, the, um, uh, basically depriving people of uh, economic opportunities and generating income, where income generation is probably most needed uh, uh, in um, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, where countries are uh, undergoing a process of economic conversion. Um, now we um, actually wanted to have Anna Krukowska um, uh, for her intervention, uh, but Anna hasn't joined us yet, so I would suggest to continue with Agne. Agne, would you like to give us your perspective on the matter? Yes, hello. Um, my name is Agne Margivitouta and I represent the International Transport and Logistics Alliance from Lithuania. So uh, basically uh, my uh, main speaking points will be oriented within the context of the single market uh, because uh, speaking on behalf of the sector that is uh, concentrated as an export oriented uh, uh, sector, we view that uh, the social package that has uh, initially been viewed uh, uh, that has uh, initially been viewed as a social improvement package has has uh, accumulated uh, with provision that with uh, many provisions that uh, uh, disproportionately distort the single market uh, as such. Uh, as uh, governments of nine uh, countries have put it in the letter to the European Parliament yesterday. And I quote, the, new, uh, the mobility package has become the new heavy curtain of protectionism that will descend on the single market. Uh, and it will drive out export-oriented peripheral EU member states and their companies from the central EU industrial and uh, uh, limit, extremely limit our uh, access to, to the single mar market. So first of all, um, uh, the provisions uh, of the mobility package will impact peripheral, peripheral states, especially SMEs and all the uh, outside countries uh, economically. Uh, in Lithuania, the transport and logistics sector comprises 12% uh, of the Lithuanian GDP and uh, any distortions which we view that will uh, occur uh, in the context of the provisions of the mobility package will uh, dramatically, uh, will cause dramatic lack of, of transport capacity uh, for European transport dependent industries. And, and as we know, there are a lot of, uh, of those. And we don't believe that the Western European industries, uh, it, it, even the French one, the French hauliers will not be able to fill the gap of, of, of this uh, of this vacuum that will be filled from the uh, competition point of view. So uh, the provisions of mobility package uh, will will become uh, uh, a problem for the entire EU community, uh, economic community that is uh, trying, and we don't know how, how, how much impact it will have from the unprecedented pandemic that we have been having. And, uh, uh, it, uh, you know, if, 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 if it will reoccur. Uh, another important aspect is that the mobility package is extremely anti-Green Deal. And we have been stressing this a lot and uh, on with, with the initiative of the Hollier's Association and our alliance, we have uh, 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 executed uh, a study. We have counted uh, the number of um, uh, empty kilometers that will uh, be accumulated between seven perifer peripheral EU member states, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary. And it is estimated that there will be 3.2, 3.2 million tons of CO2 per year due to the increased number of empty runs, which, will be, which we will be forced to have because of the rule of return of the truck home uh, and uh, the uh, the, the cabotage rules. So th these are, numbers are huge. It's also important to emphasize that empty runs are not a matter of smart logistics. It's not that we are becoming more um, more developed or uh, more smart, which is the main uh, idea of the Green Deal, but it's a result of the 
uh, well-known differences among the economies of the member state structures. So, for example, Lithuania is one of the main ex uh, exporters of transport services in the European Union, such as, for example, uh, both uh, Poland and Romania. And today, over 15% of international transport operations performed by Lithuanian hauliers already are empty runs. And uh, EU average is 12.3%. So we already have a large percentage of empty runs. And the mobility package increases it by hundreds of thousands of kilometers, millions of kilometers. Uh, that will be accumulated, which will uh, add up to the uh, C, uh, extremely increased CO2 uh, emission per year. Um, this will uh, automatically cause the whole sector or the part of, part of the sector that is disproportionately affected by the mobility package provisions to, uh, to it, it will force us to go into second grade. This is mainly because the peripheral hauliers will have to cover much longer distances to come back to their uh, to their uh, basis. So for example, from the hub uh, in, 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 in Central Europe to Lithuania, it, it, we, we have to travel about 1500 kilometers. And for example, for centrally located EU member states such as Belgium, the Netherlands, France, uh, uh, and such, uh, their distances are by three times smaller uh, by, by, by the distance. So as a result, centrally located EU states will have much, much better access to the EU freight hubs than the peripheral countries. So this is obvious. So we also view this as discriminatory and, uh, and extremely disproportionate. Also, third aspect is that uh, we already see this and we have very clear um, um, patterns of, of, of plans that the provisions of the mobility package will uh, put excessive costs, excessive extra costs for Lithuanian hauliers as well as hauliers of all the other peripheral states that are uh, both represented here today by the representatives, by the speakers and, and, and then other countries that are also not represented here, but it's, it's clear. So uh, speaking uh, speaking from on behalf of uh, a Lithuanian situation, so we have about one third of the hauliers. We had a survey recently, so one third of hauliers are planning because they they see it as an inevitable aspect to relocate closer to the EU uh, to the central EU uh, freight hubs, where they could perform um, most of the export services. So this has another uh, aspect. Uh, we think such relocation is uh, discriminatory uh, because it's forced, is forced by the provisions that are anti-competitive uh, within the context of the single market. They don't improve uh, uh, working conditions or social conditions of the workers. That was not the point. They, they uh, limit competition because you're forcing businesses to relocate. You're putting other member states economically because the uh, business units that pay taxes in, this, in, in one member state, they are relocating and they are reshifting the whole uh, economic aspect and the whole economic added value to another state just because you have two provisions. You have the return uh, of the trucks to home provision and then you have the uh, restricted uh, restri restriction of the cooling off period because of the cabotage, which we also, we, we, we view them together. So this is our special concern. And uh, we also think that all this return of the trucks home will uh, negatively affect the, actually the working conditions of, of the drivers because it will just put them even more further from their bases, from their homes, if they are, for example, operating uh, uh, from their home state. Uh, and finally, uh, the, the the last but not least, uh, we think that the provisions of uh, these exact uh, provisions of return of uh, return to home of the truck provision uh, will extremely diminish competition, and we see that it's it, it's a dangerous pattern if we talk about uh, the hauliers from third countries. We have uh, uh, we have seen the increase of. Uh, 
permits, for example, uh, permits that were issued to Russia by 40% within the recent period. So uh, we think that uh, after the pandemic crisis and uh, if we add the uh, mobility package restrictions, peripheral hauliers, they will end up much weaker. Uh, because of the incurred costs and will uh, be returning their fleet every eight weeks and will spend up to one to two weeks out of the eight weeks on the round trip return and going forward journey. So uh, we think that this will be used by the competitors from the third countries because um, uh, this, um, these breaks and these periods will be taken over by the players from the third country hauliers who uh, to whom the mobility package uh, provisions will not uh, totally apply. So, and, and, and they will automatically have a much more favorable com competition, competitive status within the single market. So uh, we, we know that, uh, you know, this, the, the market, it's, it's um, open for everyone, but you have this provision that is restrictive for the players of the single market, and it puts in uh, the players from the third countries in a more favorable condition. So, and that in addition will uh, add to more uh, emis emitting trucks from non-EU registration uh, countries on the roads of European Union. So, and we have uh, calculated and reviewed the ECMT licenses statistics uh, for third countries. And uh, we, we already see that third countries perform uh, now up to 30% of transport operations. And in comparison, for example, Poland, it um, um, uh, executes 77%. And for example, Lithuania executes uh, ab ab about 62% of the, of the transport operations. So uh, given these main uh, points that we think that are important, we, we, we we would like uh, and we call upon the European Parliament to reassess some of the provisions of the mobility package, putting in line the current status of, of, of the world uh, and of the European Union especially, and uh, uh, to reevaluate if some of the provisions of the mobility package, uh, putting you know social con uh, improvement of social conditions versus the single mar market conditions that should be even for everyone, all the players of the, of the, of the single market, if they're not uh, uh, overreaching the EU priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, keep in mind the in keeping in mind the goals of uh, the Green Deal, the post-pandemic recovery, and the single market. So thank you for the for, for attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Agne, for this uh, rich contribution, a very data, rich evidence-based contribution. You mentioned a whole bunch of different aspects, controversial issues, uh, the distortions on competition, discrimination uh, on the basis of EU passport by EU law, and you also highlighted the adverse implications on the environment, basically, because we already have thousands, hundreds of thousands of empty trucks and empty trailers uh, driving on European roads. And the number would be significantly higher if uh, the EU would add cooling off and return to base uh, policies. Now, I can well imagine that Nicolette uh, will echo some of, of, some of, of your concerns. Um, yeah, but uh, let's, uh, let's give her uh, the opportunity to voice uh, the perspective of Klesat. Nicolette, the floor is yours. Nicolette, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Do you hear me? Is this better? Yes. Okay. We can hear you well. Um, so yes, indeed, a lot has been said by, by the previous speaker and I will not sort of repeat what has been said. I think maybe the difference is that, that we represent uh, not those holiest that are truck owners, that are really asset owners. Uh, our members are largely freight forwarders that organize the logistics for the shippers. Some of them have trucks, uh, some of them don't. I think also the difference there is, I think what is interesting from our perspective is that we, we were really during those the, these three years speaking with one voice. 
in the sense that whether you speak with our members from Germany, from France, from Spain, from UK, or from Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, they all came up with similar positions. And I think that that speaks for itself in the sense that, um, yeah, we really swear we were sticking to our points. Uh, and actually from the beginning, since I, have, I was there from the beginning of the discussions on the mobility package in 2017 and even before, um, we saw it as a huge opportunity. We know that uh, the mobility package and, and roadway transport legislation is only sort of revised every 10 years. And there were a lot of problems in the market. Of course, there are problems in the market. That, that's unavoidable. But these were also dealing with um, the lack of enforceability and uh, in clarity of the rules. And so we're really looking forward to have more enforceable and more clearer rules uh, to enhance the focus on fighting illegal practices, because of course they're always in illegal practices. The question is to how will you be able to, um, to get rid of these uh, without having to, um, to punish everybody and also those that abide by the rules. And so in the previous commission and even the commission before that, they, they really sort of were hammering on the fact that we need to simplify the rules in particular on cabotage issues. And that is very disappointing because we, we turn up now uh, with a set of rules that are even more complex. So where we were coming come from again, um, not really sitting always in the front uh, seat, but organizing the logistics for our shippers, uh, we believe that, that the quality of road freight transport needed to be enhanced uh, to increase the efficiency of the road transport services. And I mean, that always goes, increase of efficiency goes hand in hand with a decrease of emissions. Uh, with a degrees of CO2, and this, this connects very closely with the, the CO2, with the Green Deal. And then very importantly is a reduction of bureaucracy. Uh, and that is something which we believe that is being really put out of proportion, because we end up now, and not a lot has been said about posting of workers. That was for us one of the main problems. As such, we're not, we're not again sort of good salaries and minimum salaries for drivers. Um, but the amount of bureaucracy that's involved in this piece of legislation, we think is, is over the top. We deal with a uh, service market, international, international transport of goods, um, which should not be uh, subject to posting. And that remains our position. Having said that, um, um, without any conclusions on the mobility package, we will end up with different interpretations of the rules or the current rules will continue to prevail, leading to further internal market fragmentation uh, and different disproportionate national measures that again would hamper free movement in a single market. So I think here maybe I'm a little bit sort of the um, um, playing the devil's advocate in the sense that I think there should be a conclusion of this package because there needs to be some predictability also for our members to know what, what they can expect. Of course, members, they prepare, they make investments. Um, and, and of course, we are very disappointed that sort of the result of this, I mean, a lot has been done for the drivers, not a lot has been done for, for the industry, but it's sort of the, um, the road haulage sector or the uh, logistics sector. Um, maybe to say that indeed sort of the single European market, and I know that you, Matthias, and your report very much focused on the importance of the European single market, uh, of the importance of uh, open, open borders, uh, and, and that became so very apparent during the last uh, couple of months, uh, where we were dealing with, um, with closed borders, with the impact on this. So I think this, I think I hope that there's more recognition for the importance to have harmonization. Uh, we very much we working with the green lanes on the last couple of months, and I mean there was even sort of um, uh, there was um, on all the rules on, on working time, drivers hours. Uh, they have been harmonized and 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 put a little bit aside over the last couple of months, which was of course helpful. Um, well, of course, we, uh, as I said before, the uh, cabotage uh, operations in the EU, 
um, will indeed lead to a lot of efficient, um, um, inefficiencies of the vehicles, uh, which will lead to considerable efficient uh, capacity gaps. And I think we also should not forget there that there are a lot of problems in the, in the area today. Uh, we have uh, driver shortages. We have a lack of uh, safe and secure parking areas for drivers who are seeking uh, appropriate accommodation, rest areas. Again, this became very apparent during the, the last uh, pandemic. Um, well, then uh, maybe to say something on your question, um, why did the EU law impose um, new, the, well, left the uh, restrictions to cabotage basically untouched? Um, well, again, I think that there is currently no longer the political will to, to liberalize road freight transport and international um, road, road freight and international transport. Um, I think indeed there's a, a tendency in Europe to further restrict uh, opening of the markets. And, and there has indeed been um, had references to the protectionistic uh, policies of Western European countries. But I also think it's fair to say that the policy direction of the European Commission and the political agenda of the Commission, they've equally changed towards a more social agenda but also towards a, a greener agenda. And I think in particular on the last point, there is a, a conflict uh, with, with what we see today. Um, and in particular, when it comes down um, to, the, um, to, the, to, to the cabotage rules, I think you also asked us to comment on the, um, on the on whether sort of there has been a proper impact assessment. Well, we all know that sort of the current rules are way, uh, way off from the original commission uh, proposals. So I think there, from that point of view, there have been interesting uh, studies, there have been other impact assessments from, for example, Transport and Mobility Leuven. Uh, they were looking also on cabotage issues in the, in the impact of the cooling off. Um, and, and, and now, of course, the commission promised to do something on the impact on uh, cabotage. Uh, for, for combined transport and also on the return of the vehicles, but of course that that's pretty limited and, and that's not covering the whole uh, the whole mobility package. Um, so yeah, what is what this means? I will, I will keep it short maybe because there, there, there may be some you may want to have some some time for discussion. Um, again, on the uh, the impact of the um, on the single market, well, what you call maybe single market disease. Um, I, I hope again that there will be some sort of uh, an agreement. There has been a preliminary agreement, which again for us is not satisfactory, but, but we need to start preparing for the future. Um, I think, I hope that there will be an opportunity uh, now with the impact assessment to correct some things. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not super optimistic there. I think we have to be uh, realistic. Um, so yeah, maybe I, I close off here and, and thank you for listening. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're very good, Nicolette. Uh, thanks also for this very rich uh, intervention. Um, you also mentioned a whole bunch of things. Um, I understand that your members, and I think this is probably true for pretty much everybody involved in this debate, um, are in favor of better working conditions for drivers. Um, no one uh, is in favor of, uh, let's say, modern slavery, a term that has frequent reviews in this debate uh, by those who advocate for the current proposal of the mobility package. Um, at the same time, your members are um, um, seeking for legal certainty. Uh, I suppose most of uh, the members that you uh, uh, represent uh, at CLESAT are already uh, working on, on scenarios about how to um, reorganize value change, reorganize logistics procedures and contractual arrangements with um, all its companies, basically. Mm -hmm. So I can well understand that there is uh, a desire for legal certainty. Uh, perhaps we will see this next week. At the same time, you mentioned that there hasn't been a proper impact assessment on the basis of the recent proposals. And um, this is concerning at least I consider it uh, very dis disappointing and perhaps also alarming 
um, because the EU is actually committed to evidence-based policy making. And I hope, and this is what we also mentioned, Nicolette, I hope that there, if the mobility package is passed, that there will be a, a sort of a correction uh, procedure taking place, um, yeah, to, to account for the negative impacts on on competition and um, the environment and the inefficiency caused by cabotage regulations, cooling off periods, and return to home uh, policies. Okay, but um, without further ado, I would like to ask um, Cosma to give us the perspective of uh, uh, of uh, a Polish MEP. Um, I'm not sure if all Polish MEPs share your perspective, but uh, I suppose you are also concerned about the impact of the current proposals. Hmm. Am I heard? Hello? Am yes, I heard? we can hear you now. Uh, well, yes, uh, all Polish MPs, all Polish MEPs uh, share um, uh, our position. Um, well, the sector of transport uh, was sharply hard by the coronavirus uh, crisis, and the mobility package will hamper the recovery of the European economy after the coronavirus crisis. But even if there were no epidemic, it would be a big blow to many industries. Transport and its cost are an important part of the price of all goods. Fewer companies on the market mean higher cost, of course, and consequently higher prices. That's why I don't understand this belief uh, uh, that France or Germany will benefit from the, this le legislation. Yes, it may be so in short term, but in the long term, consumers will certainly feel it. It's also important to remember that the social impact in the Central European um, countries where the package will cause a wave of bankruptcies in the industry, especially for small and medium-sized companies. Jobs around this transport sector, such as workshops and service points, are also at risk. The health and reversal of the liberalization of the transport services market in the European Union is directed against peripheral countries. Cabotage should, of course, be freely provided throughout the EU. This is required by the logic of the common market. In rail or air transport, such restrictions do not exist. But the companies from Western Europe have their advantage. In road transport, the new member states are the leaders. They are doing cabotage. Hence the idea of France, Germany, or, Den or Denmark, not to prevent them from doing so. This is a typical protectionist measure, a form of unfair fate against competition that has nothing to do with the freedom to operate in the EU. In other sectors, it would be unthinkable to grant an asset. For example, if Poland wanted only German or French supermarkets to be closed one day a week, to have a, a cool off period, it would be first ridiculed and then the European Commission would impose a penalty on us. The mobility package imposes such restriction on Polish companies operating abroad. Of course, the effects will be very big, both economic, social, and climatic, because empty trucks will generate emissions. We must also remember that the gap in the market will be filled by entities from third countries, Russia, Turkey, or Morocco, which will not be subject to any restrictions. They will also be impossible to control. This is, of course, a question about the future of the European Union and what really binds it together. The only objective value common 
to all member states is the economy. For this reason, the integration process has started at all. We wanted to try it in products and services without barriers to get reach. If we take the union single market out of this project, will there will be anything left at all? I'm afraid that the package is the beginning of the process of dismantling economic freedoms in the EU. The rich Western countries fear that Poland, Hungary and the Czech Republic and other countries will soon be much richer than they are and are using the political advantage to change the game. Thank you. Thank you, Kosno. Very, very well. Um, um, there was uh, one one um, argument I was struck about. I mean, you raised the question: if you take out the single market, and uh, this is this was my understanding, if you take it out from the process of European economic integration or European political integration, will there be anything left? And um, my feeling is that if people from Central and Eastern European countries feel that their own individual interests economic interests are systematically sold out in Brussels, how will they respond? And um, this is a This is behavior. a very good question, yes. Yeah, this is a, this is a behavior that we, that we see from other policy areas as well, uh, particularly in the aftermath of the global economic and financial crisis and uh, how the political moods with regard to the European Union changed in, in many EU member states. Uh, and um, this is concerning. Um, um, Anna hasn't joined us yet, so I suppose uh, that uh, we will continue with a few questions that I would like to address uh, to you. Um, so my first question would be if any one of you is actually aware of who actually injected the idea to write down cooling off periods or return to base policies in the legislative proposals. Where did this idea come from? Matthias, can I um, just mention something? In, in what you've just said and what Cosma said, um, it looks like the, the legislation was done and uh, was achieved after a strong lobbying of the Western uh, trans international transportation uh, industry. I think there is more than that, because if it was only that, I mean, only is not, <laughs> but I think it would, it would not have such a strong political support. You have to see that the, it is amazing. I was very amazed. I am a new MEP. I mean, I've been there for one year. And this uh, package has been here for a long time. I mean, it has been, you know, it, actually it was uh, uh, created in the last mandate, not this mm -hmm. mandate. And I thought we could, we could change, you know, new people, new MEPs uh, um, with uh, the, the importance of lobby, I think was, is, is less than it was before because we have, you know, good, uh, I mean, lots of new MEPs. Um, but actually, if we just, if we believe that this package is here because uh, uh, the West wants to save the, or it is, it is the, the influence of the Western truck industry, Western international transport, I think it is not enough. I think the, 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 the roots of the package are much further away. And this is why Emmanuel Macron was the, why it was such um, something so important to him. Because I think that society as a whole, I mean, the French people, they agree on that. And it's not because they want the, the, to save their industry. It's something much deeper than that. Yeah. This is what I was yeah. trying to explain, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. um, after, well, you know, uh, maybe the the public, the... the, the, the uh, um, the French people or the German people, maybe they didn't want the return of the truck every eight weeks, but they do want to see less of those trucks from Eastern Europe. And here we have to, well, this was my first intervention, but I, 
I really think that it is important to understand where all this comes from, actually. And this was as well mm -hmm. your question yeah. right now. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for it. I, I, I fully agree. Um, this, I would say, not only anti-mobility package, oh, well, and anti-foreign um, competition, uh, anti-single market sentiment is deeply embedded in uh, the cultures of many people, not only in Western Europe, uh, I, I suppose also in Eastern Europe. Um, I, I mean, I can speak for uh, my German fellow citizens. I know many people who don't like Polish, Lithuanian, Romanian trucks and truck drivers on German streets. Uh, and I suppose the same is true for um, others in other Western European countries. And um, um, the same is probably true for people in Eastern Europe who don't like uh, uh, Western European banks operating on their soil. Um, anyway, uh, we have now uh, Anna, uh, Kogovska joining, um, joined the, uh, the panel. And um, yeah, I would like to ask Anna for her comments on the theme. Um, yeah, thank you very much that you still managed to dial in. Um, yeah, the floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, I will make sure that you hear me very well now. Yes, okay. Good morning to all from Warsaw. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank uh, the distinguished speakers that were before me for all your comments. Secondly, um, what I would like to uh, stress is the fact that uh, we are looking very much in a limited way when we try to restrict transport the way we are restricting it in Europe. Uh, what I would like also to say is that a uh, revision of the package by itself, of course, is not bad. Because what was the reason for the revision? It was uh, supposed to make road transport better. It was supposed to facilitate the operation. It was supposed to allow flows between the countries move in a more simplified way, make better procedures to make better controls. Uh, to assure there is added value for the citizens and for road safety. Um, unfortunately, probably already during the drafting of the document, uh, some views prevailed that uh, stressed more restrictive approach and not the cooperative approach, but dividing the transport markets between the countries. This is one thing. And second thing, Unfortunately, during the negotiations, it was uh, growing from bad to worse. So the draft that was already missing this um, European added value of cooperation and, and good peaceful cooperation between the countries and, and uh, working for the well-being of uh, the economy, uh, this actually got uh, destroyed through added changes. And uh, why I say we maybe don't see the whole view, it's because uh, we still look at Europe and the European markets in this very old fashioned way. And it's not about Poland, it's not about Romania, it's not about France or Germany. We should look at Europe as, as one unity, as a single market, we want to make it stronger. And even if um, our drivers are still more active on the European um, arena, th there is a reason because we are, let's say, a quite a big country. We have many people who specialize, who have the skills. Um, with our holders are quite uh, strong, it's also this moment in history where we acquired this knowledge, how to be successful as entrepreneurs in Europe after our accession in 2004. But uh, we also take what the other countries offer uh, in our single European market. And last but not least, um, we would like really to thank you for your study 
uh, we think that uh, it is uh, really dangerous to forget about the economy because uh, especially now in the crisis and we know what happened in the world, we know what happened in Europe, uh, we need to help our companies to strengthen them and not to add the bureaucratic barriers that will make the survival worse. Because if we do not help our companies, we will not help our population, we will not help to grow the employment. I think uh, this is really crucial um, uh, questions we have to ask, to answer all of us, all, all of our countries, um, because um, we do not want uh, the crisis to become even worse. Um, as we noticed during the last half a year, road transport is actually the blood of the European economy. If we would stop the road transport, we prefer not to think what would happen in Europe. It is necessary. We have to be more innovative. We have to find better ways for cooperation. And this is not through restrictions. Uh, all the economic analysis done throughout the years performed in Europe or in the US, in Canada, uh, in the transport field, they prove that limitations uh, include uh, adding blockages, uh, adding tariffs, adding barriers. It's counterproductive and it's very bad for the development. It's bad for the economy. It's also bad for employment and at the end for the well-being of the societies. This is why uh, we have a lot of criticism concerning this mobility package. It doesn't mean some points are bad some with some of course we agree and some of them we support but um, it has to be rational and really let's look into the future let's uh, be more innovative let's look at the digitalization at how we can make this road transport better but not through creating barriers between the countries thank you Thank you, Anna. Um, thank you very much for um, for joining um, and uh, also for your intervention. Um, I think I, I hope no one really aims to stop road transport, inter international road transport within the EU. But you mentioned that the legal framework for economic activity is important for the process of economic recovery, irrespective of whether we talk about freight transport or any other type of service or economic activity. Um, so um, to, to round up, we are a bit running out of time. Let me address one question to each of you, starting with Agne and Nicolette. Um, um, well, the policymakers in favor of the mobility package one stress that workers will be better off after the implementation of the package. However, we also heard that uh, it is mainly people from Central and Eastern European countries uh, who are IRA. Uh, directly uh, engaged in the road freight transport industry or uh, in the value chain around it, like workshops and restaurants, as was mentioned by Cosma, will most likely suffer. Um, how do you assess the the social impacts? And did you already ex did you already uh, see um, plannings for uh, the relocation of economic activities away from Central and Eastern European countries towards? Uh, the core countries of the EU in Central and, and Western Europe. Uh, let's start with you, Agne. So first of all, uh, yes, we have made uh, uh, many assessments. And as I have mentioned, uh, at least one third of the hauliers in Lithuania are, are seriously considering relocation of the businesses closer to the, the hubs and um, um, uh, territories of the Central uh, European Union. So this clearly states that uh, there will be impact. Uh, and um, I, I know that many of the hauliers have already uh, established uh, some form of entities uh, that, that, that appear to be closer to, to the Central Europe because we are preparing for uh, the worst case scenario. 
And as far as the social uh, improving of the social working conditions of, of the of the sector, uh, I think it's important to put a, a very um, strict um, separation between the provisions that are there to clearly improve the working conditions. And I can say that uh, there were always hauliers that were irresponsible and hauliers that are responsible. And I know many, many, many hauliers all across Europe that invest a lot of money in improving the conditions both of the workers and the conditions, and which adds up to uh, improving the, the 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 service that we provide. So uh, there there should be a clear distinction between provisions that are there to improve the working conditions and then the, the provisions that are related to uh, competition and to business, uh, uh, business aspects of the sector. And as we see it now, they clearly uh, were uh, a sort of say uh, artificially um, added during the process of the of the mobility package of, of of creating all of the mobility package and now we have what we have uh, and uh, i am very very sad and sorry to say that some of the even some of the uh, the, the work improvement uh, provisions as well as the the, the business clauses uh, many of them are completely unclear how are they going to be implemented? It scares uh, us to think that up to this day, we do not have a clear explanation on the, uh, on the clauses of working conditions, which will come into force uh, in about a month and a half. And uh, we have uh, um, uh, written to the, the, the European Commission, to the members of the European Parliament, please provide uh, uh, explanations. We, we still don't have them. Uh, not to say that we do not have evaluations of impact of the mobility package, which we're very happy that the, the, this European Parliament and this European Commission have opened their eyes and they are taking steps and they are being proactive in, in evaluating the evaluating the impact. So I think a mobility package should be um, um, put into action only after both the social clauses and especially the if, if we talk about the um, these rules of, of return of uh, trucks to home and um, cabotage rules that that their when their impact is assessed. Uh, uh, properly done, yes, let's move forward with the mobility package. Today, I'm sorry to say that it has been a very, very, um, a very, very un, 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 um, untransparent process. So we'll see what happens July the end. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Nicolette, would you like to add? Um. Yes, well, I very much agree with what Agnes just said. Um, I think indeed that from the social perspective, there were, of course, issues with, uh, at the time, with nomadic, nomadic driving. We always made the point that with posting of workers and with the return of the driver home, this is already compensated. But it, it was not enough in the mobility package. So we've seen a lot of other clauses to, well, to deal with this, which and I agree in the end made it will make it, I think, even more in an, an enforceable. Um, whereas I just said that we need more clarity. I think there are indeed a lot of remaining questions and there may be a need for further guidance from the commission, such as what does it really mean? Return home, what is home? Is there some room for interpretation there? I mean, that's of course in particular uh, important for those who have own, their own trucks. But also some of our members indeed, in particular the SME do have their own trucks. And it's in particular those that may be uh, forced out of business at some point in time. Um, so yes, well, I can, I'll keep it there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, a final question to Anna, uh, Cosma and Claudio in that order. Uh, and um, I would like to refer to a question that was raised, that was raised by, by one uh, participant of the seminar. He's saying that, sorry for being straight, but what's next? Taxes on export of goods from EU 13 countries? 
we need to join efforts together with colleagues from the old EU. Do you see any way forward? And uh, referring to this question, what is the future for single market integration? Should we now abandon the principles of European economic integration, or is there any chance to any any, any chance for uh, a good future of uh, the process for the process of European economic and also social integration? Starting with you, Anna. Yes, thank you um, for your question. Uh, what I would say, uh, I'm convinced that there is a future. Uh, there may be mistakes, but it doesn't mean that we have to resign from creating uh, like our joint better Europe together. So uh, if mobility package will be adopted and implemented, uh, we will see that it's not good for the economy. It will be possible to measure it. Uh, we will see the increase of prices and we will see uh, also how the companies are struggling. Uh, and there is a chance for a revision. And I think at the same time, there are many other initiatives concerning the strengthening of the single market. So of course, road transport is only one part of this market. So I would say, yeah, of course, uh, there is a future. And uh, what we can do, uh, how we can improve uh, the approach to road transport uh, at the European arena, uh, I think uh, we have to, again, look at the economy, look at the data, uh, we need to cooperate uh, at different levels between the public administrations, between the institutes, uh, between the uh, research centers to find uh, arguments and to also talk, of course, to different kinds of organizations, holders organizations, employment organizations, workers organizations. Uh, and it still gives hope, yes, that with mistakes, we can come to something that develops and be becomes better. Uh, if we will have the numbers, how many companies collapse, how many people lo lost jobs, it will be a proof that the package was a failure. Thank you. Thank you. Cosma? Well, to be straight, yes, every action needs reaction and it will be reaction for, uh, for this mobility package. This is the first point. The second is that, uh, uh, well, the, the mobility package is called, uh, it, excuse me, it's a phone call. The mobility package is called a compromise. But it is not a compromise, and everybody knows that it is not a compromise. We, there is a future, of course. We don't know the future, but uh, we hope that the, the European Commission will show us the uh, assessment impact and will change the elements of the mobility package. And how to change it? There are proposals, there are amendments uh, from uh, our political group, from uh, a group of uh, different uh, MEPs. So it is possible, it is possible now to, to amend the mobility package to, to make from, from, from this, what we have, a compromise, really a compromise. But uh, now, this mobility package in this uh, uh, shape as it is, it is not a compromise. And of course, we will uh, do everything to change it. And we will show also other people that it doesn't work. It doesn't work properly in this shape. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this clear we, uh, reply. And uh, Clotilde, uh, yeah. will, will we see remaining politicians joining Polish efforts in, uh, in getting the EU back on the right track? 
Of course, of course, we have, uh, I think there are seven governments who have signed a common letter uh, explaining why this package is not good. I have three points uh, as perspective. First of all, the Green Deal. Um, you know, the Green Deal is such an important topic and we have very ambitious uh, goals. And one of the, um, one of the uh, subject which is very much discussed is the fact that we want to assess that every package, every regulation, every law that is being voted uh, goes in the right direction of you know, taking into account this strategy and this objective, the Green Deal. So I believe that once uh, everybody will realize that there are more and more empty trucks on the roads, the pack, if the package is voted, then they will, they will come back on this decision. So I don't believe this will stay like this. So this is the first mm -hmm. point, the Green Deal. The second point is on the legal aspect. Those governments who have signed this letter that I was talking about, I think they will, um, they, they will sue the uh, EU because this uh, package with these protectionist uh, rules is not uh, compliant with the treaty with the treaties. So there will be a legal action anyway after that. So it is a big loss of time, if you want, and of money and anyway. Mm -hmm. And the third point is the fact that, you know, all of us, we would like to have a stronger Europe. And in order to be stronger, we have to have a more convergent Europe. Why are the United States so powerful? Because they have a much more, um, uh, less inequalities when I'm talking about states, not individuals, but states, you know, if you take the poorest states of the United States and the wealthier state, the difference is, is much, much lower than what we have in Europe. And that makes them strong. If we want a very powerful Europe, and we want that, we have this ambition, all of us, because it will be better for all of us, then we need to have those convergent economies. And again, this package is not going in that direction. So for all of us, it is not a good thing. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, I agree with you on uh, the situation in the US where we see a much more single market than in the EU. And the same, even though we're talking about a different political system, it's actually true for China. Okay, uh, we are now need to close this panel. However, before releasing you, I would like to ask our audience again to participate in a quick exit poll. And we are going to ask the same question that we asked uh, when we launched this seminar. Should MEPs reject the latest mobility package proposals on July 8th? You can choose yes, no, or I don't have an opinion. So the poll is running for 15 seconds. Yeah, I see, I see submissions coming in and uh, the results, I think, indeed uh, differ from those that we saw at the beginning of the seminar. So I think people actually uh, have, a, I would say, a better understanding now about what the Mobility Package 1 is actually about and what it isn't. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you very much again. Uh, we thank you, Matthias. Participants and our thank experts. You. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. And uh, yeah, we will see you next week where we have an impact or not. And we will see it, of course, in the proceedings that follow next week's vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for organizing.